Okay, so we're going to be looking at 2.8 free body diagrams, the fifth part, looking at circular motion examples, but the basic ones. I'm going to have another one for more difficult circular motion examples in the next one. So here I have a picture of the same circle. Um, this one's from, they're just from two different views. You have one from top down, like you're in the sky and looking at the circle, which is this very first one, this one. And then you have one that you're kind of like on the same level as. Um, kind of like uh, it's a flat circle if you want to think of it like that you're just on the same level and you're looking at it from the side and that's the second one and what we want to do is look at two special directions that define this we're going to take a non-conventional coordinate system unlike the ones we did with like a flat box where it defined up and rightwards as positive right we're going to actually take a unconventional coordinate system that being the radial direction and the z-axis um, direction. And the radial direction is just anything that's pointing towards the center or away from the center. So these red lines right here, or these red forces, if you want to think of it like that, um, are pointing towards the center of the circle or away from the center of the circle. If I were to draw it here, it'd look something like this too, right? Um, if I were to, <clears throat> if I were to draw it here, the forces could either go this way or this way. This is the one that we associate with centripetal force and acceleration. That should be something pretty important. The radial direction is focused on the centripetal force and acceleration. And then the z-axis, it's better to usually represent with the second diagram, the flat circle. That is basically anything pointing upwards from the circle or pointing down towards the ground in the circle. That's kind of like a the flat box example where you have it. This is like the the vertical part. So if you were to picture it on this diagram, picture, I guess, a point right here and a vector that's pointing straight at your face or away from the screen. And then in contrast, the other direction is pointing into the screen. So there's kind of two directions there pointing at your face or away from your face. So we're going to be focusing on free body diagrams using these. Another point I want to make is that the z-axis is just regular um, Newton's second law, so no, nothing related to centripetal force. So we're going to begin with our first example right now. So here we have our first case. Car turning at a roundabout. So a roundabout on the road is basically just a circle, oops, not that, a circle, if I were to draw a circle, come on, here we go, circle, and we have just a car moving, um, let's say it's moving counterclockwise in this case, so let's say it is moving this direction, right, around that circle in this direction, and we would just want to analyze the forces on it, so I'm going to draw two diagrams here, one being the flat, I mean the sky view and one being the flat view. The flat view I'm actually going to just put it put a car here. All right, so here's my car. There. And just imagine that there's a circle that is driving that around, so kind of like this. All right, and it's just going to continue like that. So just imagine that. We're going to analyze the forces. There has to be some force that makes it turn turn in a circle in the first place, and that's a, a centripetal force. But Keep in mind that that is not the force that we're calling. It's not called centripetal force, but a force acts as the centripetal force. Um, well, I'll make that distinction when we get to Newton's second law for this case. On this diagram, the second one, the flat one, we actually have the standard weight, right? The weight and then the normal force. That one's easy. Uh, what is the force that is causing the centripetal force to work? It is the friction force. And it's specifically a static one, which is very confusing. Um, the way I think of it is that the car is not moving towards the center of the circle, so it's not moving with respect to the radial direction. It is actually just simply going around the circle, keeping the same radial distance. So that's why it's um, the friction force, specifically the static friction force, because it's not moving with respect to the radial direction or the z direction in this case either. So now we can actually start Newton's second law. So we should probably look at the z component first, since that one's the easiest. So we have, well, this case is just the easy case of normal force is equal to the weight. 
now we can look at the radial direction, which we have to use the accel a centripetal acceleration here, which is equal to speed squared divided by r, right? This is the radial direction, and some people sometimes forget to substitute what centripetal acceleration is here, but you need to do that for this, the radial direction only. You cannot use it for the z direction. So, which way is positive? That's the next question, right? I This one's easy. We can define upwards as positive, downwards as negative. This one is left always going to be negative. Well, it's not, because what if we were here, and then now the whole... Newton's second law actually breaks down. So instead I'm actually going to define anything pointing towards the center to be positive. So all anything pointing in here is positive, anything pointing outwards is negative. So it is pointing in towards the circle, right? So it is a positive force. Therefore I'm just going to write it as the force of static friction is equal to, let me write it a little bit lower, force of static friction is equal to mass, velocity, or not velocity, speed squared divided by r where r is the radius of the circle. We can actually just substitute what static friction will be. It's the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And then we can plug in what n is from our z component. So we get this. And then we see stuff starts canceling out. This is a very common that stuff will just start canceling out because of this setup that we have here. So let me just go a little bit down. There we go. And then from here we get our final result. Um, from here you can solve for any variable you want that the question asks. For example, coefficient of static friction is a pretty common one. And then the speed is also another very common one. Um, G you'll probably know as this 9.81 or 10 if you want to round, right? But this is the main takeaway. And this is the main process that we take. We take a z-direction approach, and then we take a radial direction using what we know from z. So we get to our answer from there. So we're going to do another example. Now we have our case to the conical pendulum. And this is a interesting diagram, so I'm going to draw it here. We have a ceiling. This is how I show my ceilings. And we have a rope that's connected to the ceiling at an angle given by theta. And then the ground is all the way down here, so it's suspended in the air, this particle. The particle is suspended in the air. And basically what I'm trying to say is that this cir this right here is spinning around in a circle. Let's see if I can do a circle. Actually, let me change it to a different color. Let's say it's spinning around in a circle like this. There we go. And the important parts I want to know is, well, here I'll just actually, this is the radius of the circle, this is the length of the string, and it's spinning around, let's also say the counterclockwise direction. So I want to just analyze this diagram using free body diagrams. So let's begin. We have to talk about the forces in this case. In this case, there's actually only two forces on this, and it's pretty simple. We have the weight of the object, which is mg. Let me draw it in purple. Um, mg, and then we have a tension force pointing at this angle. Um, but the only thing that makes this tension a little bit harder to see is that which angle is it, right? It could be this one, or it could be this one, right? That's the problem right here. So I'm going to say, or prove to you, that it is in fact the top one. Let me just do some side work here. Um, we have the force here and then we have I'm just gonna draw two specific lines we have this line here oops let me draw it a little bit straighter oops I moved this a little bit down let me just put it back up there we go right there and we have this line right here here's that angle we're talking about what I'm trying to say is that it's the same as this angle. This looks like something geometry would help to solve. Since these are two parallel lines intersected by a transversal, we know that this angle is equal to this angle. And since these are corresponding angles, this should be that angle, right? So that's how I proved that it was this angle. You can also say if you want, it's equal to this angle. Because they're what you call alternate interior angles. But here's the angle that we're going to work with. I have the this force and we're going to break the tension into two forces, right? Since this side, this side right here, is the adjacent to the angle, it's the tension cosine. 
or t cosine, and this one should be t sine, and this is opposite of the angle. And now we can begin our Newton's second law um, process. So I'm going to do it here. Look at the z component first. Um, let's see. It's not moving with respect to the z component, so it's zero. So then now we just simply define upwards as positive in the z direction. So it's t cosine theta minus mg, which is equal to zero. In other words, t cosine equals mg. I'm also going to actually just solve for t here. t equals mg divided by cosine. Okay, now we can look at the radial direction, which is equal to m speed squared over r, right? Because that's the centripetal part. This is the centripetal component, if you want to think of it like that. The centripetal force here is actually the T sine, and I'm still going to define inwards as positive, um, inwards towards the center. So T sine is our centripetal force, and it's equal to mv squared over r. And we actually do know what T is equal to. We can just plug it in right here. Let me draw that a little bit better. We can plug it in straight here. So we're left with, let's see, if I substitute mg sine theta divided by cosine theta, is equal to mv squared over r. And two things actually do, two things are interesting about this relation. The first, the masses cancel. The second is that we actually have a cosine, I mean not a cosine, a tangent right here. So the tangent of the angle is equal to v squared, or the tangent and then g, because we still have a g here, don't forget that, is equal to v squared over r. And I guess if you want to solve for anything here, you can. Everyone knows how. I'm going to just solve for the tangent of the angle. The tangent's equal to v squared over rg. And we're left with our final result. Let me actually write that in a different color so you know how important this result is. Oops, there we go. v squared over rg. And that's our result. So that's going to be it for this, the basic examples. We're going to look into some harder examples in the next video.